Good evening. Welcome to Tuesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. Let's look to God in prayer before we begin with our hymn. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank and praise Thee for the return of this night of the study of Thy Holy Word and of prayer. Cleanse us and wash us, O God, of all our sins as we approach Thee once again. And may we rejoice and give thanks to Thee for who Thou art and what You have wrought in our hearts in Christ Jesus. We pray, O Lord, that this night of praise, worship, and thanksgiving and the study of Thy Holy Word may glorify Thy holy and blessed name. In the name of our Saviour, be highly exalted and magnified, and every one of your children may be blessed. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, we give thanks and pray. Amen. For our hymn, please turn to 461. 461. O Zion, haste. 461. Please stand as we sing our one and only hymn for tonight, O Zion, haste. most merciful, loving Heavenly Father. We thank Thee, O Lord, for the gospel that is still able to save every sinner who would come to our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, in humility, in submission, in sincerity, and in faith. 
We thank Thee, Father, for so great and so wonderful a salvation that You have given to each and every one of us. And as we gather tonight, O Lord, to rejoice and to praise Thee and to thank Thee, and to bring before Thee our many petitions and to hear Thy holy word, we pray, Lord, for our hearts that are always inclined to obey Thee. We thank Thee, Father, for this wonderful work of salvation that You have given to us so that we know that we are merely strangers and sojourners on our way to heaven, our eternal and heavenly home. Keep us faithful. Keep us busy in the business of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And may we always do so in holiness, knowing that you have commanded us to be holy as thou art holy, so that by our good works they will see Christ in us and glorify our Father who art in heaven. Bless every one of us, O Lord, once again tonight as we search the Scriptures and bring before thee our many petitions. May thou hear us and bless us for Jesus' sake. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, we give thanks and pray. Amen. Please be seated. We continue our study on the book of Zechariah. And tonight we shall focus on Zechariah chapter 2. Verse 6 to verse 9. A continuation of vision number 3. Please follow as I read to you Zechariah chapter 2, verse 6 to verse 9. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heaven, saith the Lord. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. For thus said the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. For behold, I will shake my hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me. Amen. May God bless us, encourage our hearts in the public reading of his most holy and sacred word. The title is Flee from Babylon. Now, the title, of course, is taken from the first part of verse 6, Flee from the land of the north. And we know that the land of the north refers to Babylon because of the next verse, the daughter of Babylon. And uh, Babylon was located on the north part of Jerusalem. Now this third vision is about Jerusalem. The first five verses describe how Jerusalem will be very, very large. It will be so large that there will be not enough walls. There will be no walls. A lot of people will live in Jerusalem. Now these visions were given to encourage the people of Israel and Judah to complete the temple. Do not forget that. That will always be the backdrop. God sent his prophet Zechariah to motivate, to challenge, to keep the conviction of God's people alive. There will be a lot of challenges, difficulties such as family issues, enemy issues, people issues, all sorts of issues that can cause people to not complete the temple. And so the Lord had to encourage the people of God so that they must complete the temple. What exactly is the difference between Jerusalem and all the capital cities of the world? What's the difference? We know that when God said to the people to flee Babylon, to come out, right? That's what it means. Come out of Babylon. There will be two big groups who will come out subsequently. It will be led by Ezra, 458 BC, and then later on, not a large group, but Nehemiah and his entourage in around 445 or 444 BC. And so, when the Lord challenged the people, ho, ho, means alas, alas, take heed, take note, come forth, flee from the land of the north, from Babylon. You see, Babylon had its purpose and function and place in Judah's existence. Out of all the cities, 
God chose Babylon to be the city that God's people will be in exile for 70 years. And Babylon had never been blessed at any time in her existence outside of those 70 years. The reason is spiritual blessing, not material. Where God's people are, God is. And so you have prophets such as Daniel and Ezekiel raised up by God and where the word of God was given, how many Babylonians must have come to know Christ as Lord and as Saviour because of the presence of thousands of Jews and with God in their midst, even though they didn't have a temple. But the holy witness and the testimonies of God's people, such as Daniel and Ezekiel, and I'm sure there must be many others as well, they have brought basically the kingdom of God into the midst of Babylon, where the gospel is preached, where God's citizens are witnessing on earth in Babylon, and so many Babylonians in that time, in that generation that existed during the 70 years of their exile, they had the blessings. And God wanted them to remain there for 70 years, but now the 70 years are up. Why are so many of you still in Babylon? You need to return. You need to come back. There is still work to be done. And so when we have the title, Flee from Babylon, many of us may also like to move from point A to point B for many personal reasons. But the people of God, you were in Babylon for a purpose now that the exile is over. Why are you not back in the land of promise as God's people? Witnessing a good confession for the Lord Jesus Christ, even though you are no longer a monarchy. You will only be a vessel state under the yoke of Gentile nations because of your idolatry, because of how you failed the Lord when you were a monarchy, when you decided to reject theocracy and replace God with a human king. And what happened? More bad kings than good kings, even though God assured you from the time of Samuel when you first asked for a king, that all is not lost. If you have kings that will obey God's word, God can still bless you. That was what Samuel assured them. Even though they repented and they wanted theocracy to return, Samuel said, no. Once you reject the theocracy and you ask for or demanded monarchy, monarchy you will get, and that is what you're going to get. And it will remain a monarchy. But all is not lost. You can still be a holy testimony for the Lord if your king were to obey the instruction of the Lord in the book of Deuteronomy, the requirement and qualifications of a godly king. But they failed. And so now the Lord says, flee from Babylon. The flight, the fleeing has to be by God's command. We are where we are by God's appointment. We are not saying, the Bible is not saying that Babylon was a wrong place for them to be in. Babylon was the wrong place for them to be in right now. But Babylon was the right place to be in when they're supposed to be in Babylon because that's exactly what Jeremiah told them to do. Where he suffered so much by challenging the kings in his time who told the people of Judah, go to arms, fight against the Babylonians, they are our enemies. God gave Jeremiah the message, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, God's will is for you to go to Babylon and so you will survive and live. And when you are in Babylon, you'll be there for 70 years, so young men, young women, marry each other, have children. At the end of 70 years, I will bring you back. And so it was God's will in the time of Jeremiah to go to Babylon. But in the time of Zechariah, is now flee from Babylon. Time to move. Time to go somewhere where you are needed by the Lord. And that must be our philosophy. If you want to leave Singapore and migrate to another country, let it not be for your children's education as your reason, which is what many parents 
in Australia, for example, would tell us. Where is God in the picture? When you move from a company to another company, is it by God's instruction, by God's command, like in this case, where God wants you to be in another company because he needs you there? Or is it because you can stand the present company, the people there are this and that, and because the other company is offering you more material financial benefits? Where is God? Did God call you, instruct you, make it very plain and clear to you that your spiritual witness here is done? Go to another place. And in this case, go back home to encourage the people to complete the temple. Said the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heaven, right? That was the past. That was during Jeremiah's time. Now God says, come back. Return. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. The people in Jerusalem need help. They need you to come and be with them. Would you come back? Now, this would encourage the present laborers to complete the temple. You may ask, in what way? God did not say, complete the temple. God says Jerusalem in this first part, isn't it? The difference between Jerusalem and all the other capital cities, including the capital cities of today, is not the completion of the walls or the gates. It's not to put people back into Jerusalem like what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah's mission was to complete the walls, complete the gates, and then get the people, challenge them, and motivate them to leave their farm, leave their other cities, and repopulate the city of Jerusalem. The heart and soul of Jerusalem was the temple. Without the temple, even you have all the walls rebuilt, all the gates all repaired, and now you have rebuilt all the homes and you challenge the Jews to come back into Jerusalem to live in it and turn it into a very vibrant economic city and a very stable city. But if it does not have a temple, it's not a spiritual city. That is why it is so important, this third vision, to challenge and to motivate the people to rebuild the temple because Jerusalem is nothing without the temple. And they need to realize that. They need to realize that more Jews will be coming back. God has challenged them. God has called them. More Jews will come back. And they come back to what if you don't finish the temple? Now, we know the ministry of Ezra. We studied those three books. Right? I mean, we studied Esther before the COVID. All right? Those who study the Word of God together with us by way of Zoom, we only study two books, Ezra and Nehemiah. But for us, we completed Esther first and then Ezra and Nehemiah over Zoom during the pandemic. Ezra was sent to prepare the hearts of the people with the Word of God, to challenge them. And then later on, once their hearts are prepared, God sent Nehemiah with the hearts of the people all ready to tell them, to challenge them, to call them, let's rebuild Jerusalem. The enemies were still around, Sanballat and so on, Tobias, if you remember them. And they did, they succeeded. But all these would become meaningless without the temple. The temple must be there. Then it makes good spiritual sense to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and the gates and to repopulate it. But without the temple, no point. That's why it is so important that the people in this particular period whose mission was to build the temple completed, they have to understand this. What they are doing is so critical and so important for the future generations, for Ezra and Nehemiah's generation, for them to do their part which will be meaningless without you completing your part. That's why the command of God was to flee. By God's command, it has to be by God's calling. And because it is by God's calling, the people must see that you are just one piece of the 
huge, gigantic puzzle of God's plan of salvation for mankind. You need to do your part. Future generations will do their part, but your part will help their part to be completed, to make complete sense. Without you doing the, finishing the temple, the rest of them will become meaningless. But once you finish the temple, then Ezra's time, Nehemiah's time, when that generation, when they come and complete the city of Jerusalem, which was what chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 5 described, it will be without walls. You'll be so many people will come one day. Of course, that will be in the future. The only name on this earth that God will retain after the destruction of this heaven and earth is the name Jerusalem. That's how important Jerusalem is. Imagine that. There are so many things of this old heaven and old earth, so many names, so many cities with so many names. God picked only one. Out of the millions and millions of things on earth, everything will vanish away except the name Jerusalem. That's our eternal home, the new Jerusalem. And that's why God has to challenge his people. God has called you. You must do what God wants you to do. And God called those who were in Babylon to flee and to come out. And thank God later on, Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther will bring thousands of them to return as well. When you study the book of Ezra and you will know. The flee must be by God's command. You must flee because God cares for you. Verse 8. God cares for you. God has always cared for us. Where you are, where you will go, it is always based upon God's direction because God cares. God cares for you more than you care for Him. God cares for you when at times when you stop caring for Him, when you stop living a life of holiness, God still cares for you. For thus said the Lord of hosts, after the glory. Now what glory? After the glory hath he sent me. Now he would be God the Father, me would be the Lord himself. Unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. You see, God always cared. So even when you were in exile, all these Gentile nations that hurt you, that destroyed Jerusalem and all these, there was a spiritual reason why that Jerusalem in the time of the destruction, had to be destroyed because of the idolatry that was inside. And now that you are in exile, I know, God says, I know that these people hurt you. Many Gentile nations will continue to hurt you, but every time they hurt you, please understand, they are hurting the apple of God's eye. Do you know what that means, right? The apple of the eye is that black spot that is in the eye. Very sensitive. The slightest little dust, straight away you'll blink it, you'll protect it. That's how much God cares for you. The slightest little hurt, God says, you touch even the slightest where you'll defend, right? One small little speck. I mean, when the wind blows, when all the dust blows on your palm, on your hand, all this, you don't bother too much. You just brush it away, it's just dusty. But the moment that one tiny little speck of dust hit the eye, that speck, little bit, straight away you defend it, straight away you cover it. Immediately. That's the idea. That's why God picked this part. Right? A lot of sand blows. Your hair, all that you cover with the hat and all that, but you don't protect it the way that you protect your eye. Immediately. You shield it from even the tiniest little bit of dust. And so the Lord says, you just don't know how much I care for you. When you were sinners, I sent my only begotten son to die for you, to make you my children, God says. And you think God doesn't know that he has left you behind in a dangerous world? That the safest place to put you is in heaven with him? He knows that. And that's why when he knows that and he still puts you and leaves you behind on earth, there is something that is far more important from eternity's perspective. That he would put you and me in harm's way, as it were, in the devil's domain, as it were. When the safest place is to bring us all home to heaven. But what will happen to the earth? 
If every truly born again believer, the moment they accept Christ as Lord and as Savior, zoom, they go up. Do you know that if that happens, how will the rest of the sinners come to know Christ? Sure, of course, God can do whatever He wants, isn't it? You might say. But God gave us the honor and privilege to be the instrument in His loving, omniscient, and omnipotent hand to be the tool to bring the gospel to save sinners. And in the meantime, when you do that, God knows you will be in harm's way. And when you are disobedient, God will send someone or something to chastise us so that we will go back to Him and return to holiness and stop sinning and stop our carnal ways. God cares. And so when God asks them to flee, it's because God still cares for His people. You have to flee, you have to come. And then what is this after the glory? After the glory, my understanding is, would be the completion of the temple. Remember Haggai chapter 2? Remember Haggai chapter 2, what the Lord said. Verse 3 to verse 9. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, said the Lord, and be strong, O Yeshua, son of Yosedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, said the Lord of said the Lord, and work, for I am with you, said the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus said the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, said the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, said the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, said the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, said the Lord of hosts. And so after the glory which means after the completion of the temple. God cares. Generations of the Gentiles who have hurt you and harmed you, they will be punished. That when I ask you to return, when I ask you to flee Babylon, please understand that it is because I care for you. See, both, most of us don't like to uproot ourselves. We are people who are very, very adaptable. That's the way God has made human beings. We adapt to very hot countries, very cold countries. Somehow, we just adapt. We just want to survive. And then we will build things to help us adapt in a more comfortable way. That's the way God has made humanity. And so once you have made yourself so comfortable where you are, and that generation of young people that God now called them to flee Babylon to come back, they have never been to the promised land before. They were born in Babylon and they grew up in Babylon. The only place that they know was Babylon and they are used to Babylonian architecture, Babylonian culture, Babylonian language, Babylonian everything. And so for them to uproot themselves and to come back as it were, to start all over again, it's very, very difficult. So they have to know that when God asks you to return, it's because God cares for you. You are where you are in Babylon for that period of time because of a spiritual purpose. God needed to empty the land of idols and idolaters. Since the Jews themselves did not want to do it, God sent the Babylonians to be his cleaners, to clean out the land of idolatry. And now that you are returning, we need people to return to rebuild the spiritual testimony of Jerusalem, of Israel, of Judah. And you cannot without the city. And the city cannot be a holy witness without the temple. And so you must build because God will call them back and they will come back. But come back to what? If there is no temple, they come back to nothing. They will make the distance, they will travel, and the Lord himself will challenge them and motivate them to bring them back. And those who punish my people, those who hurt the apple of my eye, God will deal with them. And you can see that in verse 9. For behold, I will shake my hand upon them. Who? 
those who touch the apple of God's eye, Judah, Israel, they will receive their just retribution by God, even though they were instruments of God's chastisement upon his people. But nevertheless, if you ask the Assyrians and the Babylonians, both nations were used as instruments of chastisement by God because of his people's idolatry. But each and every one of them, they did it out of an evil and wicked motive. And that's why they will be punished. By whom? By the people who were once their servants. I will shake my hand upon them and they shall be a spoil to their servants. Plural. So it's not about Judah rising up to superpower and hammer them back. When the Assyrians were superpowers, Babylonian was just a tiny nation under the Assyrian rule. And then the Babylonians rose to superpower status and defeated the Assyrians. And when the Babylonians rose to superpower status, the Middle Persians were under them. And then the Middle Persians will rise to superpower status and overturn the Babylonians. And at the time, the Greeks were nobodies. And then God raised up the Greeks to punish the Middle Persians. And then the Romans were nothing during the time of the Grecian Empire. And then God raised up the Romans, the servants. Do you not see the greatness of God? Nations will come. Nations will go. But the Lord and his people will remain constant. You flee because God commands. You flee because God cares. You flee because God will soon judge. God will judge all these nations in the foreign land except God's people in the land of promise. If you live in holiness, if you live in godliness, God will protect you, God will keep you, and God will watch over you. Wherever the Lord has placed you, it's always the safest place on earth. Do not find safety outside of the Lord's will in your life. Whether it is a school, whether it is a place of work, a school for your children to study in, where God placed your child will always be the best place for your child to grow spiritually. And God will use the friends that your child will meet, the teachers and the whole school system to mold and shape your child better into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ as he learns to apply God's word into his life. Because he needs to turn theory into practice, like all of us. Right? He will have learned a lot from you at home as mom and dad. He will learn a lot in Sunday school as well. But when will he apply all these things that he learns in the school that God has chosen? And that's why it's so important that you pray with your children to seek God's will. After kindergarten, where would your Lord, the Lord wants your child to go? You pray with your child and seek God's will because in every school that your child will be in, there will be challenges, there will be difficulties, there will be difficult people. But once you know it is the Lord who has taken you from one place and put you in this place, you must know that God cares. And God will ch judge and chastise and punish those who hurt his children. Know that for a fact. It may not appear to be immediate, but ultimately, everyone who hurt God's people, all God's people wanted to do for the people of the world was to share with them the love of God in Christ. Isn't it? And what do you get in return? They persecute you, they kill you, they fed you to the lions, they cast you into the fiery furnace, they take you to court, they put you into prison, they do whatever they want to hurt you. Why do you think the Lord in the judgment of the trumpet turned the ocean into blood, one third of it, and then finally in the vow judgments turned all of it into blood? You want the blood of my children so much. Well, now I give you blood, God says. You study that passage. 
when the trumpet judgments concerning turning the ocean and the drinking water into blood, one third of it, the angels came and explained and to mitigate and to challenge anyone who dares to challenge what God did, that what God did is just. You want the blood of my children? I give you blood. God loves you. He always has and he always will. And therefore, when you want to move from point A to point B, whether in service or in your workplace, whatever, even to migrate from Singapore to another country, if it is by God's command, go. Do it. But always know that God always cares for you. Do not leave because of difficulties. Because if you do, you are no different and no better than the people of the world. Do not leave because of carnal and material reasons. Because if you do that, you fail the Lord and you fail yourself and everyone who depends on you, your family. Because that is carnality. When your motivation is not by God's command, not by God's care, not because of God's judgment against the enemy. You just want to move for your own personal reason. Whatever it is, you may argue, you may justify, you may defend. Try to defend it in front of God and you see what happens. Oh, you defend in front of man, oh, you win. You're stubborn enough, nobody will have any argument that will convince you because your mind is made up. But before God, be honest, be genuine and be sincere. Flee from Babylon. Where is your Babylon? It served its purpose for a time when God's purpose for his people to be in Babylon. But once that purpose was accomplished, they should and ought to return. For there was much work for them to do in the land of promise to turn Jerusalem and the witness of Judah and Israel into a holy nation again. Remember the world was at peace for the wrong reason. The world was at peace when there was no holy testimony to stir the false peace that they enjoy, that the devil had lulled them into. But once the light of Christ shines through his holy testimonies and witnesses, the nation of Israel, and today will be the church, false peace will evaporate. And then they will be stirred and they will be challenged to turn to Christ as Lord and as Saviour, and what the devil has done to them in turning the world into a state of spiritual deadness and spiritual stupor. God will raise up Israel. God will raise you up wherever you are as a holy, fiery testimony so that more sinners will come to know Christ through your witness and the gospel you share. And that cannot happen if you do not go where the Lord sends you. God will position us to where we are needed most with the people that he has prepared for you to minister. Isn't that what Jesus meant when he said, deny yourself, take up the cross? God has designed for each and every one of us with a wooden cross with our name on it all of us. But the problem with us is we want to carve our own name on our own tiny little crosses. And when you do that, you go where God did not send you. You go alone. When you go alone, you fight the devil alone. You cannot win. But when you go where the Lord wants you to go, like in this instance, God says, you, call, you come back from Babylon, from the daughters of Babylon. You uproot yourself, inconvenience yourself, whatever it is, come. And thank God, they did in Ezra's time. And then after that, God called Nehemiah 
And thank God, this generation, they completed the temple in about four to five years' time. And then God will send Ezra's generation and then Nehemiah. They all need to do their little part in order for the complete picture that will culminate in the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to be what it is to be the saviour of the world, to be born a Jew, an Israelite, where Israel cannot cease to exist. Israel must remain, even though it was under the yoke of the Romans when Christ came the first time. But Israel was still there. Israel cannot die because the Lord must be born an Israelite from the tribe of Judah, a Jew. God always has his plan and his people. One generation after another, and each and every generation will be given its own unique battle to fight. But every battle is just one piece of God's amazing, colourful, perfect tapestry, which he called the body of Christ, the church. And you and I are part of that. But we need to do our tiny little part in this huge tapestry that God started from the moment Adam sinned against God. And that tapestry will one day be finally completed. At the end of the millennium, there will be no more human beings being born because this world will vanish away. And everyone who is meant to be born will be born. And then we will all be ushered into the new heaven and the new earth as the bride of Christ. Do your part. Go where God has sent you. Flee from Babylon if you are commanded by God to do so. For where you are, where God sent you, be faithful. Know always that God will always care for you. And those who hurt you, know that he will surely chastise. Let him chastise them in his time. Vengeance belongeth unto the Lord, not to us. Just be faithful. Know that God always cares. Even though you may suffer persecution, even though you may suffer the loss of material things and even your loved ones, but never doubt his love and his care for you. And so when he asked them to flee Babylon, it was because he loved them and he cares for them. There is so much more work to do. And the people who are building the temple, they needed all the encouragement. And this third vision will help them. Now, we have not finished the third vision yet. God willing, next, Lord, next week, we shall complete it by looking at verse 10 to verse 13. Let us pray. Almighty God, our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for salvation, grace, and mercies that You have given to us. And though we are instantaneously ready to enter heaven, You have left all of us here behind in this dangerous world where You have never forsaken for we know that salvation is still readily available to any sinner who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and will surely be saved to the uttermost. Send us forth, O Lord, wherever you want us to be, as thy blood-bought children, the cross with our name on it. And may we be faithful as we discharge our responsibilities with thy enabling and thy help and the filling of thy Holy Spirit that we will be faithful witnesses, knowing always that you loved us and you will always care for us. And those who hurt us will be chastised by thee in thy own time. Help us, wherever we are, to shine brightly for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that he will return very soon. May we all never be weary in well-doing, but to keep on serving no matter what the outward circumstances might be, whether in sickness or in health, in war or in will, may we keep living for our Saviour until He returns or call us all home to glory. Bless us, O Lord, as we depart and dismiss for our own prayer meeting. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, we give thanks and pray. Amen.
I would like to share with you one prayer item from uh, Sister Siu Ming concerning Alicia and uh, Elder Lee Kong Sing. Thank God that Elder Lee Kong Sing had a smooth nose surgery. He went for a surgery this morning, I believe. Okay? Because of some turbinates and also to realign a crooked cartilage that affects his breathing. So, thank God the surgery was today, even though there's still a little bit of bloody discharge, but the doctor says it is safe for him to return home, to recuperate. Please also pray for Alicia. Alicia had some problem with the new medication that she took. There was what they call contraindication reactions. And so she was hospitalized for headache, migraine, and dizziness. Thank God for the wisdom given to the doctors who treated her because of the new medicine that she took. She suffered chronic fatigue. She will also be doing another MRI on her brain to see if the tumor has progressed. Thank God she was also discharged today. Please continue to pray for Alicia as she adapts to the new changes to the medication. Okay? So please pray for Alicia and uh, Elder Lee Kong Sing. Thank you very much. Let us all break off into our groups and seek the Lord's blessing and favor. God bless.